all here now, so let's get started. Welcome to panel 224, Finding Workable Models for Enhanced Cooperation. Uh, I think today we'll aim to do three different things. First is to look at the national model, what has worked and what hasn't worked, and lessons learned from that. And then look at the international level, see where the state of play is and where there's opportunities to learn from national experiences. And taking advantage of recent uh, developments with the ICANN Brazil um, Summit that's coming up soon, we'll have an update from the meeting that ended just before this, this meeting and look at ways we can apply um, what we've learned at the national level and the state of play at the international level to come up with some inputs into that, into that new summit. So let me start by introducing my panelists. We have Joana Varon from Brazil, FGV, CTS. Um, to her right, we have Anya Kovacs from Internet Democracy Project in India. To my left, Bertrand de la Chapelle from Internet Jurisdiction Project in France. And um, Alice Munia from Kiktonet and the Kenyan government. So Joana will start us off by speaking about the experience in Brazil. Okay, um, I believe that many of you know about the steering committee, uh, Internet Steering Committee in Brazil. So here I'll try to bring uh, some more details about how the, the internal procedure of CGI, of uh, implementing a uh, multi-stakeholder mechanism and what's its role in, in Brazil. Uh, and some gaps it has in, in terms of efficiency and mostly political power within the, the country. So CGI-BR is how it's called in, in Portuguese. Uh, it was created by decree in 2003 and it has representatives, nine representatives, uh, representatives from government in nine uh, um, ministry, agencies, and councils, different ones. S um, and then it has a uh, private sector, um, eight representatives from the private sector, eight from, from the third sector, and from, from the technical community, the same number. So more government, the same uh, on private, third sector and technical com community plus uh, secretary executive. Um, those representatives are elected through a um, uh, set of organizations in private sectors. Other mood stakeholders can um, apply to be part of the, I don't know how to say that in English. Uh, in Portuguese it's Colegio Eleitoral, so it's a uh, the electoral college. So this electoral college is it's open, and anyone anyone know any uh, organization from the those stakeholders can apply, and then it's formed, and each organization can uh, propose one candidate uh, from its own uh, community. No? Um, and then this, the candidates, uh, you, you have the pool of candidates and the private sector can vote only to, for one representative in the private sector, but the other sectors can vote for four representatives among its own sector. And that is how it's formed. And the role of CGIBR in, in our uh, political space is just to propose resolutions and ideas. It doesn't have a regulatory role or a binding uh, power. So just as the principles that we have and has inspired the Marco Civil, uh, those were principles they were there, they were took for a legislation, but it's always non-binding. And and for me, it's good. Uh, I don't think we should have a regulatory agency for the internet. But on the other hand, uh, sometimes the government doesn't even have to listen to or to have a look about, uh, on what CGIBR is saying. So 
I think the gap here is at least governments should consult CGRBR and have their opinions. And I think that's the major problem in the scenario. So I will stop here and uh, give it to Deborah. Sure, we want to make this pretty interactive and also to actually take ask, take the time to ask some specific questions to see what we can learn from the different models. So I wonder in the case of CGIBR, who's actually responsible for funding it? Oftentimes we see even with the IGF at the national or international level, there's no funding or it makes it difficult to plan. So I wonder in Brazil how you've tackled that problem. Uh, CGIBR is also the manager of .br, so it's pretty rich. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a good a good practice there. Okay, so um, I think we'll move on now to to Alice from Kenya to t talk a little bit about Kiktonet. Uh, thank you. Uh, Kiktonet is the Kenya ICT Action Network, uh, and it, it's a multi-stakeholder uh, platform that brings together. Um, the, gov the government, civil society, private sector, and now increasingly the technical community uh, to actually support uh, the national uh, the national role, the national development uh, plan. Uh, especially taking into consideration that ICTs uh, is a cross-cutting pillar of what we call our, um, our blue blue development blueprint called uh, 2030 vision. Now, um, the Kenya ICT Action Network was actually set up uh, coming after an impetus, um, impetus from the World Summit on the Information Society in 2003, where the issue of a multi-stakeholder approach to ICT policy uh, and, and regulation uh, was discussed at length and uh, with, with the various documents that emerged from there. Those of us who participated in that process then went back to the national level, and that's around the time that the government was also looking at uh, reforming the ICT sector, the communication sector, um, by introducing in competition in the, in the mobile sector, by uh, um, you know, introducing reforms, uh, regulatory reforms, uh, introducing a new licensing framework uh, that was uh, technology neutral, uh, and, and basically uh, a, new, a new wave of, of, of reforms that involved uh, quite a lot of actors and also um, the media you know, covered at length, simply because uh, the, by then we had a budding private sector in the ICT, um, the, the ICT sector, a budding private um, in industry, uh, you know, Safaricom and others that be began to felt that they also needed to be part of uh, the governance process. Uh, but then we didn't really have an active civil society around that time, and that's in 1999. And the civil society that was there was, you know, Echo News uh, and others, some of them that had actually brought the internet to Kenya for the first time in 1993, uh, and others who had started uh, developing, uh, uh, you know, a commercial and uh, uh, a business model uh, for, for, for the domain name sector, if, if we may call it that. And also after redelegating, for example, the .ke uh, CCTLD, then we, we had an industry and a sector and civil society and you know, quite a number of individuals that were actually actively involved at the global level that began to actually push the government to be a little bit more open to involve other stakeholders. Around that time, um, there was also a wave uh, of uh, reforms that you know, um, promoted by the UN Economic uh, Commission for Africa. Uh, basically uh, looking at introducing national ICT policy frameworks. Uh, and by then, there's there'd been a lot of projects, uh, civil society-led projects, for example, catalyzing ICTs in Africa that had begun to develop awareness around the need f uh, to have other stakeholders involved. So the Kenya ICT Action Network was then formed out of that, you know, that process in 2004. Uh, and very actively participated in building the capacity, not just of civil society, but also of, of business in, in terms of how to engage with government. Because many business, the business community in Kenya had a very tumultuous relationship with the government. It was you know, a constant you know, fight put out in the public and that wasn't, and we had a government then that was not very, that would have, was averse to that kind of approach. So civil society introduced, uh, you know, a sort of you know research first, you know, so that we can in, we, we get informed input into uh, the national process. 
uh, involving business, first business and civil society only, and then forming a very strong alliance, the Kenya ICT Action Network that then began to engage with government uh, from a very strong view. And also in invited international partners, uh, the Canadian IDRC, uh, and others, DFID, that were funding the process, uh, but also the business also started funding uh, the process, making the Kenya ICT Action Network actually independent after several years. Anyway, concretely, uh, the Kenya ICT Action Network literally uh, developed the policy, the Kenya ICT policy, uh, 2006, that was uh, approved by cabinet in 2006. Uh, and as a result of that, we now have a Kenya, you know, the ICT master plan. We've got so many other policy documents that have uh, evolved from that um, and, and uh, processes that have, um, have increased the openness and have involved other stakeholders in the ICT policy processes, you know, including an open data, uh, open data initiative, uh, involving uh, other stakeholders in, in various governance processes. Uh, for example, you know, some civil society members en ended up being on the regulatory uh, authority uh, uh, and also creating uh, a separate uh, authority. Now, now it's called the Kenya ICT Authority. It used to be the Kenya ICT Board. Uh, it's still quite an active uh, network, still really manages to influence uh, policy. Uh, and it doesn't matter the change of government. We now have a new government, we have a new minister, they're still involved in it. Uh, and the, the ICT Action Network was if the one involved in, in, in organizing the Nairobi ICANN meeting. Members of the IC, uh, Kikta Network were, were responsible for organizing the, IGF, the 2011 IGF. Um, and also, you know, generally speaking, uh, in uh, contributing uh, to institutional uh, evolvement of the Kenya ICT, but to know what we're calling the ICT authority. Uh, I'll stop there and wait for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. I have one quick follow-up question. You mentioned that there was a change in government earlier this year, and I wonder how the process was impacted by that. You said it continued, but were, were there any challenges with the change of personality, a change of leadership um, with, the new, with the new government? Uh, yes, I think there's always that in, in every environment and every country. And there, there is, we are currently having, uh, you know, well, I wouldn't call it challenges. We have a new uh, minister. Uh, but one of the things that we did manage to do uh, before the change of government is that I think uh, for, for those who know Kenya, we have a new constitution that, uh, you know, uh, which actually eventually enshrined the, 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 the multi-stakeholder principle. Uh, so which means uh, most, most stakeholders can actually sit back uh, and, and demand to actually be involved in policy making. So it doesn't matter whether we get a new minister or, uh, or, or, or permanent secretary. Um, we, we've made sure that we can demand, we, stakeholders can demand to, to have uh, space uh, in any policy making. And that was also evident uh, in our contribution to the Wicked process uh, last year. Um, and continues to happen t to date to the point where, you know, civil society and the business sector is still influenced in what goes on uh, in government as far as the ICT sector is concerned. Thank you very much. Um, now we'll turn to Anya, who will give us an experience in India of multi-stakeholder frameworks there. Thank you, Deborah. Or maybe rather the absence of multi-stakeholderism. Um, I think in India we have a very interesting uh, contradiction in the sense that uh, the government has generally been quite supportive of the principle of multi-stakeholderism, especially in its discourse at the global level. Um, and uh, I don't think that's uh, double speak or bad intentions, but unfortunately we don't actually see that translated into practice at the national level in the same way. Um, before September last year, the number of opportunities we had to engage with the government were very few and it was really difficult for civil society especially to get those opportunities. Since September, things have improved a little bit. The Minister uh, of Communication and Information Technology has made several attempts to reach out to a broader community. He started with uh, inviting first global civil society and then Indian civil society for a meeting at the IGF last year. Then we had various meetings on topical issues uh, around which there was a lot of uproar within India. Um, 
In the end, civil society and business were also allowed on the national delegation to do wicket. And I think uh, if you look at the initial draft proposal of India and the stances they finally took, they uh, shifted their position quite considerably. And uh, in our reading, that has something to do with the, the feedback they were given from civil society and business, because it is in that direction that the positions shifted. Since this August, uh, the government has also established a multi-advisor uh, group, a MAG. Um, so in the whole, one can say that something is slowly moving. Um, why might this have happened? Uh, to some extent, I think uh, we have a little bit the situation that uh, what Alice was talking about in Kenya earlier as well, that uh, people who are active at the global level, who see and hear the government use this discourse all the time, more and more at the national level are also asking, so why don't we do this here as well? Um, with, I guess, also some positive feedback from the government that's as well. To some extent, this was also a political uh, uh, there was a political reason as well, in the sense that in the course of various cases of censorship in the, co in the country, this minister in particular was really vilified for his presumed role in this, to the extent that one magazine had a picture of him on the front cover with a Hitler moustache, something that he didn't appreciate at all. And so to some extent, it's, one gets the impression that it was also an exercise where he realized that perhaps with national elections coming up next year, his reputation was not going in the right direction. Um, I think a final factor that played a role in a slight opening up was that uh, there were certain uh, people in the business community who were very supportive of multi-stakeholderism. And uh, their support, I think, also helped opening doors and helped the government to gain some faith. Because even I was in a conference in Delhi on cybersecurity last Monday and Tuesday, and it was amazing how across the board, civil society, people asked me, like, oh, you're part of the subversives. Then uh, civil society was held up as absolutists. And I think in many cases, those tags don't really suit the work we do. They don't match. Um, so it was, uh, I think, some confidence building also had to happen and the business sector played an important role in that. Despite these positive evolutions though, I think on the whole, um, even if one takes for example the establishment of the MAC, which seemed like a positive thing, that unfortunately aborted another process in which there was a MAC as well, uh, which was led by an industry body and for that reason, though the government participated in it, had been a little bit controversial. Um, that process was completely cancelled at the moment the government established the MAC, despite the fact that the earlier MAC was already quite a long way into organizing a national level meeting, and so people had to cancel speakers, etc. Uh, the new MAC has also been uh, designated in a top-down manner. It's the government who decided there was no input into this. And so far, despite the fact that it's constituted in August, there is no clarity on either the agenda or what it's supposed to do. There has not been a single meeting. It's again, I don't think it's ill will necessarily. Um, it's partly because governments are slow and bureaucratic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But on the whole, even if the intentions are good, if there was another process in place that got stopped, the outcome for, say, civil society is not necessarily a good one because the opportunities to engage for us have actually decreased rather than increased. There's also a question about how much any of these bodies will deal with politically sensitive issues. Last year, the government, uh, the minister uh, uh, was uh, challenged in parliament about in, uh, su su about a set of rules on intermediary liability and to kind of ward off having to actually change the rules. He said we'll have a multi-stakeholder consultation about it. More than a year later, we still haven't seen that consultation, despite the fact that he's met with us for several times in between. Uh, like I mentioned, we'll have a national election coming up next year when there will be a change in the regime because multi-stakeholderism is not inscribed in the system at all, it's, or not yet at least, it's a wait and see if the new government will continue that line. Um, we will have to see. So on the whole, I think the landscape in India is very uneven. On more traditional issues like health and education, India actually has a fairly strong uh, record of 
consultations with wider civil society, perhaps because they are more mature fields, perhaps also because they are less sensitive issues. Um, it's, it's typical also that corporate donors that are Indian actually like to give money to education and health because it's easy to be seen as a do-gooder without getting yourself into trouble like you can with more politically sensitive issues like internet governance. Um, there is uh, the telecom regulatory agency, TRI. They, do, they have a very systemized process of uh, consultations, but like in Brazil, the government often doesn't take into account what TRI, for example, has recommended. And so again, then the question is, what's really the point? I think multi-stakeholderism, uh, the Tunis agenda says explicitly that internet governance is about shared decision-making processes. And a consultation where it is not even explained why your content is not taken in, into account or your recommendation is not into account is then not really a multi-stakeholder consultation, I would argue. So while consultation might happen, I think uh, shared decision-making is still a long way off and there is still a, a quite a strong desire to maintain control over the process, which I have a sense that people are fearing they will lose if it becomes an actual multi-stakeholder process. Thank you, Anya. I have a follow-up question to your point that certain issues were seen as more politically safe um, and there was more room for engagement, such as education and health. I wonder within the topics that are included in internet governance, whether there are topics within that that are more friendly to governments to look for input and whether you can start making inroads on those. Well, good question. I guess in India, access is quite a, um, a popular and safe topic in the sense that at least on mobile phone revolution in the India has been quite staggering. The number of connections is massive. Uh, they haven't yet been able to replicate that with internet or broadband internet, but at least there is a real political will to expand uh, the network. I think business is very interested, obviously, in taking this forward. When it was clear that a whole lot of rural areas would never be served by business, the government decided to use the Universal Service Obligation Fund to roll out fiber at least to all the uh, communities, local communities. Uh, so they're building on that. I think that's a much safer topic. Um, but yeah, not necessarily one that um, one can make the same kind of input in also. So in that sense, that's a shortcoming then. So Anya and I were, were chatting just before the session, and she was sharing some interesting ideas that she has on enhanced cooperation at the international level and ways that you can deepen multi-stakeholder engagement, perhaps in India, based on those ideas. So I was hoping that you could share those with us as well. Well, for the global level, we uh, the Internet Democracy Project made a proposal um, where we try to get out of the trap of arguing that either you need to maintain the status quo or you need to have a new body, be it IGF or a new body at the UN to deal with all internet issues. Uh, our point was that good governance is often decentralized governance, uh, which brings in many more people, many more experts, as a consequence of the wider spread, has greater engagement and also often higher quality outputs. And we thought, especially for developing countries, that's actually really important. You need to know when you engage at the global level what the exact agenda is you're going to engage in and what the outcome is going to be. Um, so the idea was that uh, rather than having one body, to follow a decentralized model where one could, for example, draw on the VISTAS action lines, which already have a lot of internet governance issues embedded in them, so we would suggest you restructure the WISIS action lines and start building on the facilitating agencies of different issues, like on privacy, it would probably partly ITU, but UNESCO is responsible as well. And from there, start to build a new architecture. Um, increasingly, I was thinking it's actually probably something one should aim for at the national level as well, because I cannot quite see how the same experts can actually deal with every single internet governance issue. That's why I made my qualification about access, for example, as well. Some of the technical aspects of access, at least at the moment, I'm not going to claim that I have 
uh, grant expertise on that to actually advise the government. I'm quite sure there are others in civil society who do. They're not necessarily experts on hate speech the way I am. And so I think if one wants to actually make space for this, the fact that different people have different expertise, it's important to get away from the one body will solve all problems model. The thing is that perhaps at the national level, the challenge of moving into that is even greater than at the global level because what it basically means, of course, is democratization of governments, governance on the whole, right? It means that you want multi-stakeholderism everywhere. And so I can see that the starting point might still have to be one process, like CGIBR in, in Brazil, but I'm not sure that should be our end point, whether we should stop there in our imagination, because I think it will actually be too limited, and I'm quite sure, like with other forms of governments, in 20 years' time, if this is the model we'll follow, there will be a revolution of decentralization, because people will realize again that centralization does not fulfill all needs. Thank you, Anya. Um, I really do want to continue the discussion on the global level, um, but I want to take a step back for a minute and see if we can actually extract some more tangible um, information from the different models we've talked about so far. So with CGIBR and Kiktonet, um, from a little bit of background knowledge, I understand that Kiktonet is often an online platform rather than a, an in-person meeting, and I wonder with, um, with CGIBR if that's similar or if we can kind of get down to the nitty gritty what how do these models work? What do they actually, um, what's the day-to-day -day process? What issues do they deal with? So without um, putting you on the spot, um, Joanna, if you could, could give us a little more information on that. Yeah, they, they have uh, different sets of actions. Uh, they do research, very important research on technical issues and policies and and on statistics so the m most accurate data on connectivity and so on and so forth is comes from one sector of CGIBR and they do they organize events they are the organizers of the Brazilian Internet Forum that happens once a year but also organize many other events throughout the year, uh, either on, on standards, more technical or more political. Um, and then they have Nick VR, and uh, internally they have one one uh, general meeting per per month with a agenda that has has to be set in advance so and then and then they depending on the political scenario they can discuss or, or in the issues that are arising so they can discuss uh, things like for instance uh, spam so they have a really good resolution on how to solve spam through the door 25 in Brazil and that was actually started to be adopted adopted by companies and so on so a quick follow-up question um, for international decision making: Does how what role does CGIBR play, let's say, at the ITU or at other UN forums where they might be, or international forums where they might be discussing internet issues? Yeah, as as I mentioned, they don't have; they are independent uh, organization. Is very sui generis, the juridical figure of CGIBR, and. And, and they don't have uh, decision-making power. So in they come to international forums as consultants for, for the Minister of Foreign Affairs or, or, or in the ITU particular who, who rules and, and who, not who rules, but who, who represents Brazil is our uh, telecom agency. And the relation among they, they are part of CGIBR, but there is a huge issue between both in terms of, because they have political power and not, they don't listen to CGIBR as much as we would like to. And is, what's the role between the public, between citizens and CGIBR? Do they do consultations? Do they do outreach to citizens and ask their opinion on various issues? Or is it more of an expert body that once they're elected, they work 
independently? Yeah, but, um, it's quite open. They have the representatives from the third sector uh, and the technical community, part of the technical community, our, our points of contact and interaction. Um, I don't remember any kind of consultation, but it, it takes into account that it's already multi-stakeholder, so I think. Thank you, and I'm going to um, put some of the same questions to Alice. I understand, um, as you said, from the Constitution of Kenya that public consultations are in fact part of the consultation, the Constitution, and that um, oftentimes online consultations are a form that the Kenyan government uses. So if you could tell us a bit more about that. Um, in Kenya, for the last five or six years now, um, any piece of policy or regulation uh, from the Ministry of Information Communication or from the regulatory authority is is always first made, uh, you know, put out in the public. Um, and by the public, public here I mean newspapers, you know, radio, and on Kiktonet. So it's quite a special uh, network, online uh, online forum. Um, and most often, the permanent secretary and the minister would then uh, request for comments, uh, providing a particular deadline. Uh, and what happened used to happen before, uh, simply because we also wanted to build capacity, we would have. Uh, one or two people, uh, for example, someone, Grace, for example, Gigi sitting there would be, would be dealing, for example, with an issue to do with intermediary liability. I think that's the latest issue that we were dealing with. Actually, before uh, intermediary liability, it was the wicket. Uh, and so what, what would happen is, um, what normally happens and used to happen is we will ask to, you know, to have access to the document. In this case, it was Kenya's position. Kenya at that time didn't have, last year didn't have a position. Uh, because the African uh, Telecommunication Union had already developed an African position and was hoping that each government will then just simply endorse it. Uh, so that was then made available on the Kikton at least. Uh, and what we did was to encourage as many stakeholders as possible uh, to contribute. Although I must say one of the things we noticed is the business sector at that particular time obviously did not contribute as much because they had a completely different uh, take on, on, on uh, some of the provisions that were being uh, proposed. Uh, while civil society, we had quite a number of civil society uh, individuals and, and organizations participating uh, and providing input. And what we'd normally do is take the document, provide alternative uh, versions to some of the cl clauses, and then present it to uh, the regulatory authority or to the ministry. And then ensure that we, we are all that there are also uh, civil society uh, and business and technical community as part of the national delegation. So that's how it works, and it's been working since uh, 2004, and continues to work that way. Uh, or, you know, uh, on every piece of uh, you know, be it legislation or uh, policy that we are discussing. I think if I'm Gigi might correct me if I'm wrong, but we are currently discussing the data protection. Uh, and we are also also somebody's, some of the civil society organisations are trying to encourage a discussion on the African Union uh, Cyber Security Convention that is meant to be um, uh, to be adopted in 2014. Uh, and you know the Kenya ICT Action Network mailing list is also has a website. So um, and it has everybody, including international people who who are not Kenyans. Uh, and so you have everybody contributing to it, uh, and, the, uh, and the ministry and government taking it seriously, including the regulatory authority, uh, and some of the stakeholders following up to ensure, you know, literally asking where are our contributions, how come they're not reflected on the ICT policy document, and if they're not reflected, can you explain to us what, um, you know, uh, what logic you used to, ex you know, to not include this particular, you know, aspect of it versus this other particular aspect. And so there's a discussion that goes on. Uh, and, more, you know, several times the government has been taken to court, including the, the regulatory authority. Um, we've got two or three cases that, for example, that stop the government from implementing, the regulatory authority, for example, from implementing a determination that was going to introduce uh, price cups, tar new tariffs uh, for mobile, you know, they are taken to court. 
um, you know, um, hiring a new director general for the, the CCK taken to court because you know civil society believes there's conflict of interest. Uh, so it's it's quite it's pretty active. It's a pretty active network that has a very strong, for example, an extremely strong consumer network, um, and we are seeing trade unions as well uh, as part of it. And that's how it starts. You know, the discussion is started off by uh, an interest group, which is then taken on. Sometimes ends up in a you know, court decision that actually tells the minister, I'm sorry, you cannot hire this person. And can you just explain or clarify how one becomes a member of Kiktonet? You said there's international um, international members, but in Brazil, Joana described a pretty um, institutionalized process with an electoral college, and it sounds quite different. So is it just a member of self-selection and joining, or is there something a bit more to it than that? It's actually, so, you know, just joining. I think the only thing that we try to do, we have uh, a technical person who um, manages the list um, to avoid trolls. So we demand that you tell us why you want to join the list and you know what interest you have, uh, and also to make sure that we don't that the list doesn't degenerate into somebody calling the minister names or the the, the CEO of Safaricom, you know, because everybody is there, and so we are quite selective on who we accept. You have to really tell us who you are and where you're coming from and what your interest is, yeah. Uh, and we don't discriminate any nationality. That's fantastic. Um, so in the interest of time, and because I really do want to leave some time available for questions and an interactive, se interactive session, I'm going to uh, hand over to Bertrand, who's going to talk a little bit about international enhanced cooperation at the international level and his thoughts on that. Thank you. First of all, it's a great pleasure to be here, and especially on a very gender-balanced panel, uh, or once. Uh, enhanced cooperation is, a, is, a, is a, an expression that has had um, a life of its own since the WISIS. I like the title, actually, of this workshop, which is uh, Finding Workable Models for Enhanced Cooperation. I won't delve into all the um, significations or the, the meaning, sorry, that uh, have been proposed for enhanced cooperation. There is a working group on enhanced cooperation that is, um, that is underway. What is interesting is to look after the, the experiences or the examples that have been given at the national level. Uh, what we mean by enhanced cooperation and trying to look at an element of uh, looking forward, because finding workable models is identifying what works, but also trying to imagine new mechanisms or ways to, to, to work together. In the expression enhanced cooperation, there is a word that is extremely important, which is cooperation. And especially at the international level, one of the strong messages that I would like to share is the need for cooperation. If you think about it, as, as was mentioned, I'm the, uh, the director of an internet and jurisdiction project. And this is a dialogue process to bring the different actors to talk about challenges regarding jurisdictions. One thing that is striking is many issues that are related to the internet and particularly to the use of the internet, not so much the um, architecture of the infrastructure of the internet, but the use, what people are doing on the internet, the good things they're doing and the bad things they're doing, or the tensions because of the things they're doing that some others don't like. This requires a particular amount of cooperation that does not exist in the international space naturally. Not only does it not exist in the nat international space naturally, but the international space fundamentally prevents the cooperation that is needed. Why does it prevent the cooperation that is needed? Because the international intergovernmental relationship is not based on cooperation. It is based on separation. You may have heard me say that often. The default is separation. The default is the territoriality, which is very legitimate. I'm not criticizing it. I'm just stating a fact. The whole architecture of the international system in order precisely to prevent wars, to prevent as much as possible tensions and establish peace, was to agree that there are boundaries, that there are territorial boundaries, 
and that the law within those boundaries were determined by the government of that country, that the laws in that country do not apply in the territory of other countries and vice versa. This is not a cooperation architecture. This is a separation architecture, a very valid, efficient sometimes separation architecture. But the international space and the role of diplomats, I've represented France, uh, my country, uh, as the thematic ambassador for those internet issues between 2006 and 2010. The role of an ambassador is not to define the global public interest. Let me repeat, the role of an ambassador and a government is not primarily to define the global public interest. It is to define and define and defend the national interest. And if there is any tension between the national interest and the global public interest, which may happen, the duty of the government elected government is to defend the national public interest. And unfortunately, this is not a basis for cooperation. So the architecture of the intergovernmental relationship is not naturally conducive to, to cooperation, especially because in any <coughs> intergovernmental organization, and it, and it is, again, just a fact, not a criticism, it's a mechanism, to put an issue on the agenda, you first need an agreement of all the members to put the issue on the agenda. Which means that if for whatever reason the topic is a problem for one of the, of the countries, the issue will not be on the agenda until sometimes it's too late to address it correctly. So that's one first problem. The internet is bringing, because it is cross-border, the internet is bringing a type of issues that fundamentally require cooperation among actors and the whole architecture and the in whole institutional architecture, the whole discussion mechanism, the whole um, rules of procedures are not fostering cooperation as a principle. But the second challenge is that at the international level, there are very few spaces that allow for the discussion of actors other than governments. And in internet matters, <coughs> the reason why we push the multi-stakeholder approach, or most of us believe in the multi-stakeholder approach, is not for abstract reasons, it's not because it's a new cult, it's not because it's uh, a principle that we consider absolutely better than anything, although participation is a very good principle. But it is mostly because this type of cooperation between the different actors is absolutely needed. If you do not have the different actors around the table, you cannot solve the problem. And I say that not only towards governments, it is also true towards businesses and towards civil society. And in that regard, I'm extremely happy that if you paid attention on the program, the title that is being used for this year is, and I give credit to Mervi and uh, from, from Finland and to uh, Urio, uh, who in the WISIS plus 10 meeting in February, uh, I think in Paris, were the first one that I heard utter the expression enhance multi-stakeholder cooperation in order to break this debate about enhanced cooperation is just among governments and enhanced cooperation is not among governments. It is about finding the right, what I call the right issue-based networks that get together around the table the relevant stakeholders that are needed to address an issue. And here I would like to, to, to piggyback on, on something that was mentioned before. The traditional way of doing international cooperation or international relations uh, in institutions is to create a single structure, a body, an organization that deals with all the issues related to X. So there's a World Health Organization, the World um, Tourism Organization, UNESCO, and all the, all the others. 
this is all well and nice, but it has a certain number of issues. Uh, one of them is that you cannot prevent necessarily uh, interagency bickering. That one agency says, well, that's part of my turf, actually. The other one says, no, I should be dealing with that. But the second thing is that, and uh, it's a, <coughs> it's a well-known secret, when you have one ambassador for one, for one country that is in one organization and another ambassador for the same country that is in another organization, the coordination among them is not always absolutely perfect. And in addition, even if it were perfect, the dynamics in one organization may become a different dynamic in the other one with the glorious result that the decisions in one organization may be contradictory with the decisions in the other. Not to mention the notion, that to, to pick on what Anya was saying, when she is very modestly saying in civil society, and it's probably the same in business, we are not specialists in everything. When you are a representative in the embassy in one country like Geneva or in Europe, but particularly Geneva, if you have a small embassy, you are the first secretary or the third secretary, and you are going to meetings that deal with absolutely anything and everything. One day it will be a meeting at the WTO, the next day it's a meeting at ITU. So it's not even the subtopics in one specific domain, health, which is already enormous. It is on a daily basis, and it's wonderful to talk to, to those people. I mean, they've been my colleagues in the past, and when you talk to people who are based in Geneva, they tell you it is extremely difficult to cope and to, to keep up with what is happening, which is actually one of the biggest unbalances. Anybody who says the international system and the UN system is actually providing a fair representation and the capacity for the small countries to participate, it is true to a certain extent. But the unbalance in the human resources is nonetheless making it an extreme burden for people who have very limited uh, people on the ground. Why am I mentioning this? It is not to lambast the international system. The international system has its functions. The intergovernmental system has its functions. What I want to highlight is the fact that for most of the internet-related issues, you need an additional layer or a different type of cooperation. And to give you an example of, of, of mode of functioning, when I was mentioning the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, we started two years ago with a hint or a, an intuition that the term jurisdiction was something that was going through a lot of issues and that it was actually one of the major challenges, the, the tension between the cross-border nature of the internet and the patchwork of national legal frameworks on jurisdiction was going to be a tension. Little did we know what was going to happen in the coming year, but never mind. <coughs> it turned out that we thought it was necessary to bring the different actors around the table. And at the end of the first year, after a series of discussions with a lot of people and few meetings and so on, we actually spent a lot of time to frame, <coughs> and I mean spend a lot of time to frame the questions in a way that is acceptable by everybody. <coughs> and it may seem minor, but in terms of models of cooperation, Anytime you want to build a coalition or a, uh, <laughs> a, a discussion or a dialogue around a topic, you need to make sure that you can attract the relevant stakeholders. And the only way to attract the relevant stakeholders is to, with their help, formulate the common problem in terms that are common to all. And it takes time. It is you often very quickly uh, bypassed. And to give you a concrete example, we had a workshop yesterday on the, for the Internet and Jurisdiction Project. And during the workshop, one of the participants who had been in the meeting we organized in Delhi was looking at the brochure you all found in your, in your um, uh, tote bags and mentioning that we were addressing the issue of domain seizures, content takedown, and access to user data. And as a civil society actor, Sunil said, the benefit of the project is that you're using neutral wording. We would have said how to prevent surveillance and how to restrict the uh, uh, unacceptable censorship. 
you don't launch a discussion of enhanced cooperation with an activist wording. You need to have a space where the activist can come and say what you're labeling this way is not acceptable because, but the way we solve it is the following. So I just wanted to highlight this because models of enhanced cooperation start with making sure that you are on an issue-based approach at the international level, that you identify the relevant stakeholders, which is a challenge because it's easy to identify the ones who are usual suspects and obvious. But sometimes you have the problem that you have some relevant stakeholders that need to be there, and actually they don't want to be there. They don't want to be there because it's going to infringe on their own interests, or they're afraid there will be a regulation if it's the private sector, or if it's the government, they are afraid that it will infringe on their capacity to regulate, and so on and so forth. So finding the way to make sure that the ones who need to be in the room are in the room is one of the most difficult challenges. And it, is, it takes a little bit of prodding, but it's important. The, the third element is the, uh, the formulation. Uh, again, sorry, is the, is the fact that when you conduct the dialogue, to get people around the table, you need to move very progressively. Because you are constantly under a tension <coughs> between depth and width. Not, so, not only on the topic, you need to narrow progressively the topics to make them efficient. But even when you have narrowed your topic and, and squared it, a multi-stakeholder process, an enhanced multi-stakeholder cooperation, needs to be effective and inclusive. In order to develop something effectively, you cannot develop something effectively, a regime or framework or whatever, by having 300 people discussing all the time on what the next law is or what the next framework is. It's not practically operational. Therefore, you need a smaller group. OK, then you get into trouble. Because if you want to be multi-stakeholder, how do you form the, the smaller group? One solution is to form sub-constituencies, so you have different electoral colleges. It usually leads to a very interesting battle of, OK, how many uh, electoral clusters? Then how many seats per electoral cluster? Uh, and this is also a power relation. But at least it's one thing that allows the formation, because these are methods we, we know. The second methodology is you get one body, and you get a nominating committee of sorts that gets um, suggestions or candidature, and then pick and, and put in. Uh, as you know, the ICANN board is composed a little bit in the two dimensions by a combination of a nominating committee and um, constituencies. But there probably are other models that we haven't explored yet, and it is one of the most difficult challenges that we completely overlook when we talk about enhanced cooperation. Because making a list or having a broad debate mailing list is okay. It's easy. Handpicking a very small uh, group to, to steer the process can actually work. When I talk about the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, it is actually run by two people, Paul Fellinger and I. So we are not generated by the multi-stakeholder group, but we are steering it as facilitator. So this is a very important element. There is often a, a desire to run towards the formation of a board. And to give you a personal anecdote, and I don't want to take too much time, when I wanted to launch this Internet and Jurisdiction project, it was, supposed to, it was intended to be a global exercise with a lot of actors, and I wanted to create a structure in France, a non-profit structure, to be able to manage this thing, get funding, and do the things. And I couldn't create an association. Why couldn't I create an association for a not-for-profit exercise? Because the rules in France say that one, you need a board, and two, you cannot be both the manager and um, receive a salary and be the board yourself and so on. And I didn't want to do that because I didn't want to have to create a board at the onset. It may come in due time, but the facilitation role was, was, was primary. So, just to finish, because it's already taking long, the reason why I'm mentioning this as an illustration is that these are a certain number of the lessons 
that I'm taking from the process that I'm running now, which I consider as an attempt at building an enhanced cooperation mechanism. The goal is to develop a framework of cooperation among the different actors in the course of next year. But if you hear what I just said, I've already spent two years to simply, on the first year, frame the problem correctly, and in the second year, identify the building blocks that will be discussed as, as a, um, uh, a potential framework. So time is an extremely workable component in multi-stakeholder processes. And actually, when it works and when you have the practice in place, it works in the right way because Multi-stakeholder approaches allow to surface issues faster than traditional mechanisms for the reasons I mentioned before. Because you can surface them faster, you have a little bit more time to address them. But if you try to do a multi-stakeholder enhanced cooperation system when the issue is extremely tense, it is much harder. So these are a few of the, uh, uh, of the issues, the, the ideas I wanted to share. And, uh, as a final point, the articulation between the international and the national actually, I think, functioned very nicely from the international to the national if we do the international well. And my guess, pure guess, is that there is likely to be more new multi-stakeholder issue-based governance frameworks at the international level than at the national level at first, because there is a void to fill at the international level on some issues where we do not have anything to deal with them. Whereas at the national level, you have institutions that are already in place, and inserting the multi-stakeholder approach is changing the balances of power. And I don't know how many times in the last two and a half days you have heard the word parliaments when people are talking about governments. It's as if the international architecture that we have is only based on the executive. The parliament seem to be out of the picture in this, um, in most cases. However, they are very important in the constitutional architecture, and the challenge of consultations is much more in direct relation or intention with what the parliaments normally do than what the government is normally doing. So that's just an additional thing. I think finding good international issue-based networks on very limited subjects with good cooperation will tremendously help convince people at the national level that it's actually the way it works well. Thank you, Bertrand, for those very interesting comments. You give us a lot to think about. Um, in terms of, I think we saw some common themes here in terms of issue-based networks, in terms of how to bring the actors to the table that you need to be at the table, and practically, how do you make this operational? How do you go from having a loose network, like you see with kick to net but then actually able to make effective policy making? So I think there are some common themes here. I wonder, we have about 20 minutes left. If there's uh, some questions from the audience, if we can make this a bit more interactive. Um, and Grace, if Grace, do you have the microphone to do the roaming mic? Um, yeah. So we have Lorenzo here, and then there are a few other hands. Okay. So we have Lorenzo here, and okay. then there are a few other hands. You've been overtaken temporarily. <laughs> oh, there's another mic. Thank you. My name is Subhi Chaturvedi, and I teach communication and journalism in India at Delhi University, and I run a foundation called Media for Change. I want to uh, go back to what Shapal mentioned uh, uh, however, briefly alluded to the idea that governments, governance, and participatory democracies have often been used interchangeably. When we're talking about enhancing cooperation, and I'm so glad that we're talking about enhancing multi-stakeholder cooperation. Um, when governments speak with governments, very often crucial voices that are central to the core of the internet get left out. I want um, Mr. Chappelle to please dwell on that a little more when uh, we're speaking about the difference between multi-stakeholderism and 
participatory, however participatory democracy might be, it's still a top-down process. If you could elaborate on that for me, please. Thank you. Should we take a few more questions and then answer them at once? Take a few more questions and then um, Lorenzo Pupillo, Telecom Italia. I have a couple of questions. One for the representative from Brazil. Um, um, you know, I like the model of CIG, and by the way, like Fadi Sheda from um, ICANN is suggesting that uh, this model should be exported to other countries, you know, to guarantee a more stable approach, major involvement uh, in each country. But my concern is uh, it's on the uh, historical uh, part of this uh, union. In other words, I know that when it started, it did, uh, you know, and, had an important role to play. Is this the same, uh, um, is happening the same right now or maybe because of what's happening in, uh, in Brazil at the moment? Instead of this, uh, I heard, you know, I heard different, uh, um, uh, different voice regarding the fact that at the moment this uh, CIG is not working, it used to do. Okay, so this is the first question. The other is for Bertrand. Um, I agree totally with you that the uh, internet, because of this cross-border uh, nature, uh, requires an additional layer. And so, um, you know, it's important to cooperate, to involve all the stakeholders. Uh, the problem is that, uh, are we sure that uh, if we look historically to, to what happened to this model, that uh, shared responsibility means also equal responsibility. It is the right, to go to, the right way to go. In other words, uh, we all know that the government now wants to play a major role, but not because, uh, uh, you know, they, they understand now what probably before they didn't uh, uh, think about, you know. So probably in the past, we didn't have, in, a, in other words, shared responsibility became automatically equal responsibility because one part of the equation, it's a one variable, was almost absent to some extent. Now the situation is different. So I'm asking if uh, for the sake of uh, developing, pushing forward this model, we need to be more uh, flexible on that. In other words, to allow also for some type of, uh, uh, as long as we involve uh, the different components, we should also allow for uh, not a model of equal responsibility, but only shared responsibility. As long as this, uh, maybe over time, all the different players share the leading role. Are there any more questions at this point? Uh, Merlia. Are there any more questions at this point? Merlia. Thank you. Sorry I arrived late, so if you have already made comments about that, just disregard. Um, something, I'd like to pick on the point that you mentioned, the difference between shared responsibility and uh, equal responsibility. Like uh, when we talk about the role of governments, and Brazil has made a proposal about that, and I think it's really important that we discuss this point. We have not discussed what is the role of other stakeholder groups. And I have this feeling that not discussing this point overlooks that fact that we need all to be on the table for the process to be meaningful. But the reasons that drive us to the table are different. So the sources of legitimacy of civil society, of companies, of technical community are totally different. And if we overlook that, I think that we blur some lines that make the process really complicated. And we really impoverish the process by saying that we have a shared uh, and, and equal responsibility. And we were in another workshop uh, that we were discussing that there is not an internet governance model. There are several models depending on the space and on the layer that you are talking about. And some layers, the private sector have leading role, and some layers, the technical community has a re leading role. And it has to do, I think, because of these different sources of legitimacy and different reasons why the stakeholders are on the table. And I think it's only natural, it's normal. Um, so I would like to elaborate a little bit on that, how we could discuss not only focus that much on the role of governments, but also talk about the role of other stakeholder groups as well. Mm -hmm. 
Well, a few, a few elements. Um, I'll try to go quickly. The first one regarding participatory democracy versus multi-stakeholderism. It's a whole debate in itself. It has a bit of an academic dimension. Uh, I think it's more important to, to focus on how to make people work together. And I would half jokingly saying that in a multi-stakeholder approach, it's supposed to be bottom up. But there's no bottom up if there's no up. It, it seems like a joke, but something that doesn't have a, a dual component of something that steers is responsible and accountable to whatever the bottom large group is, does not function. As a matter of fact, the model that I personally uh, support is not bottom or up. It's a circle whereby the people are around and there's something in the middle that helps the dialogue among those people. The second thing is, I found myself since the, the beginning of this IGF in a strange situation of uh, being almost in a position of uh, being the one who defends the governments because on most panels, we are all civil society, businesses and so on, but surprisingly, we don't invite governments. And uh, it's not a, a criticism, it is just, it turns out that I have been in governments, I represented my country for four years, and I've been in the Foreign, Foreign Affairs Ministry for, for uh, more than 15 years. And I want to avoid the situation where it's always they. It's always they are bad or they don't understand or what they do is ridiculous. Some do, of course. But the point is that in many cases, if you talk to governmental representatives, if you talk to law enforcement actors and so on, everybody is struggling with the current architecture. That's the reality. The reality is that government officials, the only tool they have is to adopt laws and regulations. And if they all do it separately, because there is no synchronization, there's no cooperation, they will, we will collectively end up with an architecture or a patchwork that will be so incompatible that it will make the problem of harmonization harder than making it simpler. And so we need to push for cooperation so that whenever governments, but also the private sector and also other actors, make their own decisions, they are sufficiently aware of what the others are doing to avoid making things worse. The second, the second element, the third element is regarding what um, Joanna was mentioning on the consultative role somehow of, not consultative, but not decision-making role of the GIBR. Multi-stakeholder cooperation or multi-stakeholder mechanisms can go to decision-making but there are gradations. One example of something that is not really decision making, but that is decision shaping that is sufficiently strong is what we did with Wolfgang Kleinwächter and a few others uh, in a small group in the Council of Europe that was tasked by the Council of Minister in a multi-stakeholder manner to conduct a consultation and draft principles and recommendation. We did, con con we're a group of five people from the different stakeholder groups. We conducted this process and the end result is that the draft itself was adopted by the Council of Ministers without modification. So we didn't make any decision. But the draft, a little bit like the proposal for the Internet Governance Forum by the Working Group on Internet Governance and WISIS, was endorsed and integrated in something that was formerly a decision by the ministers. But the nature of the decision was actually determined in a multi-stakeholder process. So I think we need to take that into account. There is not a, such a straight line between decision-making and non-decision-making. If the process of consultation and cooperation is sufficiently good and balanced, you don't touch the balance of the result when you are the decision-maker because this is exactly why you established the process in the first place. And finally, uh, to come to, to, to Lorenzo's question about shared responsibility, uh, I will happily repeat a, formal, uh, a formula that I've used, I think, for the last seven IGFs, I guess, uh, which is that the idea that we separate the roles of the different stakeholder groups according to the paragraph 35 of the Tunis Agenda in very nice buckets where people only do something is nonsense. And I repeat, it's nonsense. 
The reality is the roles of the respective stakeholders vary according to the issue, the venue, and the stage of the discussion. And it is a matter of efficiency to understand when, why, who is the convener, who are the stakeholders, who do you put around the table. If it's something that deals with intense law enforcement issues, that is a real thing. You need to have a lot of law enforcement, but a significant number of the other actors as well. It is something that deals with mostly business relations. You need to have the other stakeholders, but that varies according to the issue. It varies according to the venue, because if a civil society initiative, like the one I'm doing, is taking the initiative, it will weigh the participation of the different actors, maybe in a different way, from an intergovernmental organization launching something that tries to be as multi-stakeholder as possible, where they will invite a different balance of people. But it also varies from the stage of the discussion, because the earlier you are in the process, the more open you can be. You want to have as much input as possible in the early agenda setting and issue framing phase. And this is what the IGF is about. It's an issue framing and issue um, identifying um, system. When you get into drafting, as I said before, you tr get into the challenge of finding less people to do the drafting and the question of how do you select them. So there are less actors, but the balance may be different. When you get to the validation of the result, as I said, it can be only one stakeholder group. But if it has been prepared in a multi-stakeholder manner, it's different. So one thing uh, I want, I want to, to stress very strongly, apart from this variability, is we all have, as individual, multiple stakeholderships. We should not be forced to be stuck in one specific silo. I am constantly arguing that, as a French citizen, I am interested in the way the French legal framework functions. I am represented by my government, the successor of my successor in those processes now. But I'm also the user of some platforms that are in another country, and sometimes I don't agree with what the government of, uh, or the level of the European Union is doing to those platforms, because I like those services and not the way the privacy protection is being made, for instance. Or on the contrary, I'm also on the board or a member of an NGO which is actually pushing harder than my own government for a certain topic. And it is essential that people who participate in processes are not forced to say, I am civil society, I am business, and so I cannot find any box to tick in my present situation, and I don't want to have a box to tick to be able to participate. Thank you, Bertrand. I think we have a question for Joanna. So to clarify, to, um, I agree with you, uh, CGIBR is an example of a successful one uh, in which we managed to bring uh, different st stakeholders and to work together and to um, bring, bring important new ideas to the Brazilian scenario, but for the sake of thinking about finding workable models for, for enhanced cooperation, I was just pointing uh, one, one criticism, which is this part exactly of decision making, and also in agreement with Bertrand, I don't think they, they had to have that role on decision making, but they need to be heard. Um, unfortunately, until a few months ago, six months ago, b before NSA scenario, that there was the, the scenario. And as there is conflict with Ministry of Communications and um, our regulatory agency wants to increase its role, just as ITU wants to increase its, its role to internet issues. And they have this decision-making power, and they were like uh, implementing crazy regulations that has to do with internet without hearing CGIBR. Uh, as the the scenario changed with the the Snowden revelations, 
uh, internet governance became an issue, and then our president had to pay attention to it and and try to to figure out what what is this enhanced cooperation, what's what's the difference of multilateralism, of multi-stakeholderism, what is these people talking about? And I think uh, door was opened now uh, in, for CGIBR to to take this step further to be properly a consultative uh, organism and, and for our uh, president and our other government entities to, to consult and to have a look of what they have been uh, proposing and saying. So I think that's it. Thank you, Joanna. Did anyone want to answer um, Merlio's question on the role of other stakeholders? Anya? Well, just a response, because I fully agree with the point. Um, but I think it's interesting if you look at uh, the Tunis agenda, as Bertrand points out, it kind of lists particular roles. And I think part of the reason why for civil society sometimes it's difficult to be too aggressive is clearly we are not doing. Most of us who are actually active at the global level are not about enhancing collaboration with communities. Um, it's much more often about export input, sometimes also about representation, but it's a much more varied role. And I think at the moment we've gotten a little bit stuck in this whole um, political economy around uh, internet governance, how there are different camps of governments, uh, and the fear some governments have about reopening the Tunis agenda. So I think perhaps civil society has also gone along with that a little bit too far. As far as we are concerned, I think we have to insist we open at least that part of the Tunis agenda, because clearly that definition is, is, is worthless. Um, so I think there is a bit of a, a contradiction there. I think in general also you're completely right. Uh, speaking for civil society, I think we should spend much more time defining our own role and what we can contribute, and actually much less time thinking about governance. I'm not saying it's not an important issue, but I think the way you shift the balance in these kind of things is by having your own agenda, and by actually putting that forward and by acting on it. Not just saying things, but um, putting your money where your mouth is. Um, so I completely agree with you on that. If it's okay, I would also briefly like to come back to what Subi asked. Um, I think it's, I mean, people do use governments, governance, participatory democracy, perhaps as synonyms, but obviously they're very different. The governance discourse came into vogue when uh, the move to public-private partnerships happened, especially under the push from the World Bank in the 1990s. Uh, participatory democracy, of course, has a longer and more complex history, but it's clearly something else. I would say multi-stakeholderism is not a form of participatory democracy. I would say that it's substantively different, even though it's a form of deepening democracy. But participatory democracy is essentially about consultative decision-making, not about shared decision-making, and that's a qualitative difference. So this idea that different stakeholders can play a different role in different processes is not part of participatory democracy. And that's why I still like to use this term and keep it separately. Are voices left out in multi-stakeholderism? Very much. Do we need to be concerned about that? Very much. But I'm also really worried when, I think it's important to always mention two things at the same time, which is we need more diversity and we need more action to actually make sure that multi-stakeholderism is implemented in practice. Because at the moment, civil society, for example, has a massive resource issue. Uh, when it comes to multi-stakeholderism, try and attend all these meetings globally. There are very few people who are able to do that. And we've been lucky in the past year or so that we can. I can tell you, actually being present physically makes an enormous difference in terms of how you understand the process and how you can input into it. And remote participation might sometimes be a solution, but it's not a consistent replacement. And so when we argue for diversity, I think we also at the same time need to take up the responsibility of thinking, how will we deal with that contradiction? It is not a problem for business. It is not a problem for some governments. It is a problem for other governments and most definitely for civil society. And I really think we should make thinking that true more of a priority. Sure, and then I think we have one more question from Desiree. 
No, a very, very quick uh, comment on what Anya said. Thanks for the distinction, participatory democracy and, and multi-stakeholderism, I understand better. On the last point you make, I know it's a burden for civil society, but I can tell you, and I really want you to understand, that it is becoming an incredible burden for governments as well and for the businesses. Everybody is trained, and is, if I had now a common, uh, an issue of common concern to put on the table that we need to address is the structuring of the calendar and the convergence of topics. I mean, we are now absolutely overwhelmed, and 2014 and 2015 are going to be a major issue. As a matter of fact, I would almost on the fly suggest that this becomes a major issue of the event in Brazil, which, by the way, is not a, sum a Brazilian summit. It's a non-summit in Brazil. <laughs> but I would put that on the agenda of Brazil. The next two years are going to be a nightmare, and anybody who cares about the capacity to participate will be stretched beyond the limit. It's a very good point to end on, especially it's something we can all agree on. But I just want to see if Desiree has a question, if we can take that, and then we have to wrap up. Thank you, Deborah. I just wanted to expand a little bit of uh, what Marilia said, and I'll have a question for the panelists, maybe for all of them, and uh, in terms of roles and responsibilities of other stakeholders rather than civil society. If I were to start from myself as a user and what kind of responsibilities I have, I see, you know, I have technical responsibility to run my network or machine, well, political and social, and maybe other organization as well. Um, but where I'd really like maybe to hear more about this op, um, thing that Bertrand has said, that um, it depends about the venue issue and um, other things who's got kind of a different role. Could you expand the equal footing, any of you? How do you fit equal footing participation and the difference in venue stages of the conversation? Thank you. Should we just run the mic down the table? One example which we use also when we speak about that decentralized model of internet governance we would like to see at the global level is let's say if you take, should we have a privacy treaty globally now or not? I think that's a question that's on many people's minds. It's not very clear where that should move. That's not a question one would only want to leave to governance. So our proposal would be that you set up a multi-stakeholder working group that actually defines the problem as narrowly as possible, then looks at different ways that that could possibly be solved, and makes a proposal or a recommendation on that. Now let's say that they actually recommend that it becomes a treaty. From there onwards, we would say that it is the government process that takes over. Treaties are negotiated between governments. But a treaty that is the outcome of a multi-stakeholder process in which that multi-stakeholder group has set a certain set of conditions or modality within which that treaty has to operate is a very different treaty from if, let's say, governments start negotiating tomorrow. So I think that's, for me, one example where it's an equal footing in the sense that the decision to follow a certain path for a solution is a common decision. But it doesn't overtake, say, the government's role because it still recognizes that that particular solution that's chosen will give prevalence to governments in actually implementing it. I hope that is a worthwhile example. <laughs> If I may also just build on Anya's point, I'm really glad you mentioned the privacy treaty because as you look at the human rights framework, you know, governments don't have rights, they have responsibilities to ensure rights. And then in the role of surveil in the issue of surveillance, companies play a huge role, but really at the end of the day, it's the governments still that have to enforce the rights and companies have a bit of a different role. So I think if we talk about equal footing, it's when you start at the issue, when you start talking about negotiating a new treaty, there would be an open working group, there would be an opportunity to start commenting and to work on text, but you have to admit at the end of the day, it does still, as Anya said, fall on states to implement. So, Bertrand. I have a very simple way to define the, the, the multi-stakeholder approach, 
which is that it is premised on a fundamental principle, which is the right of any person or entity to participate in the governance processes dealing with the issues that it has a stake in. It's as simple as that. It is as radical as the universal suffrage, which allowed the right for anybody to vote on any issue, which when it was introduced was unbelievably um, foolish. The notion that anybody irrespective of education, wealth, uh, or whatever, could have exactly the same right to uh, vote was incomprehensible. It nonetheless worked relatively well. We are now making, because we have the tools that allow a different type of participation, uh, an equivalently big leap regarding the right to participate in the, the, in the processes dealing with the issues you have a stake in, which means that you need to have a little bit of stake, and in the course of the discussions, you may be less accepted or less involved if, you, if there is a need to reduce the number of people who deal with a drafting or a validation, and there is no particular stake for that group. But the fundamental principle is the right to participate in the governance processes. The second element regarding treaties and so on. There are many different instruments for uh, putting down on paper agreements. Treaties among governments, guidelines, um, advocacy pieces for by civil society, contracts, everything. What is missing today is a type of arrangement that allows commitments by the different categories of actor on respective functions, provided that the others respect the same functions. That's the way a treaty works. A treaty works, basically, a government says, if you behave this way, I will behave that way. We do not have any kind of existing framework that allows for governments, businesses, civil society actors, and international organization, and technical community, and whatever, to basically agree on the same sheet of paper to say, if you do this, I will do it this way, and so on. But that's what we need. That's what we're trying to develop with the Internet and Jurisdiction Project. In the case of ICANN, the tool has, is regulation by contract, basically. But the affirmation of commitment is the first attempt at having a sort of arrangement that basically in one document has changed the nature of the relationship between the United States government and ICANN, transforming the accountability mechanism from an accountability to one government to an accountability to an internal mechanism towards the community. We need frameworks of commitment. Uh, I think I, I, I share the, the use of this expression a lot with, with Wolfgang. <clears throat> and the way it evolves is that if there is a framework of commitment of that sort, such a document may include paragraphs that some countries voluntarily may decide to incorporate in their own national law. Paragraphs that some companies participating in the regime may include in their uh, binding corporate rules saying if we are operating in a country that has signed this agreement and incorporated it, this is the way we're going to behave regarding the request that they send. This is something that civil society groups may incorporate in some of the documents they produce or that would precise how those civil society groups can participate in the processes that will be put in place. We need new frameworks and not rush into drafting either treaties or, or guidelines or statements which are drafted by only one stakeholder group. Okay, actually we're running a little bit over time, so thank you everyone for coming and really enjoyed the discussion and I think we should probably get out of the room soon because we're 10 minutes over.